Thank you. So it's a privilege to be here alongside Dragan and Patience. And I just want to thank Small Wonder, really, because um, refugee voices are frequently heard in the news as little more than numbers. So we hear about millions of people coming in hordes or teeming across Europe. And it's just amazing, really. And don't underestimate what a remarkable thing it is that today, in this place that has such a rich cultural significance, we're actually bringing real people with tales of their hopes, their fears, their tales of trauma and tales of family. So we really don't um, take for granted the fact that we've received this invitation. Thank you. So before I introduce Patience and Dragan and give them the detail they deserve, I just want to take a few minutes to give you some background to the project. So I work for Gatwick Detainees Welfare Group, as you've heard, and this project tells not just tales from the creative imagination of the writers, but also stories of real people who've experienced immigration detention. So Gatwick Detainees Welfare Group works out of Crawley, which is a town not a million miles from here. It has 70 visitors that visit people every week um, in two detention centres at Gatwick. And the people that visit offer unconditional acceptance. They offer the hand of friendship in the most difficult time. They offer emotional and practical support. The people they see may not speak English, may not understand why they're detained, may be separated from their family, may be desperate, suicidal, self-harm, depressed, suffer PTSD. It's not an easy thing to visit people in detention. There's nothing you can do to change their situation. And sometimes you visit someone and they're too unwell to even speak. So I think some of our volunteers might be here today, but they're absolutely marvellous people doing an incredible job. So there are 600 people kept at any one time in the two centres. One is on the model of a Category B prison, so it's quite a dehumanising environment. People can be segregated, they can be locked in their rooms for many hours at a time. And bear in mind that these aren't people who've committed a crime. Being kept in detention is an administrative convenience. 32,400 people a year are kept in detention. It's harder than being in prison. When you're in prison, you count down the days to your release. But when you're in detention, you count up the days to an uncertain future. There's no time limit. So just think about that. I visited people who've been in detention for days, well, not many actually, but a few, weeks, months, years. The longest I know someone to have been detained is nine years. Half of the people in detention are subsequently removed, but that means that half the people in detention are returned back into UK society. It costs 35,000 pounds a year to detain someone and half of the people are released back into the UK. So what's that all about? We say it's a waste of human life, it's a waste of money, and it's an inefficient system. So, Refugee Tales came about as a response to the situation of indefinite detention, because the UK is the only country in Europe that detains people indefinitely for administrative convenience. France, for example, has a 28-day time limit for detention. People that we visit in detention told us that they wanted their stories to be heard, that they felt invisible, but they couldn't do it themselves. They couldn't tell the stories in the first person. Some of them were asylum seekers. They didn't want their families, their communities, their governments to know where they were. Some of them feel there's a stigma attached to being in detention. They didn't want their communities to know they'd been detained. They felt that they were imprisoned. They, they pretended they were working overseas. And some people simply don't want to draw attention to themselves while their case is being decided. They don't feel that that's a careful thing to do. So we decided to ask writers like Dragan and Patience to meet people in detention and people who'd worked with people in detention, have meetings with them. I'm sure they'll talk to you later about the process and write their tales. And then we borrowed unceremoniously, we borrowed the Canterbury Tales model of journeying and telling stories. We made long walks, and every night on the walks, 
the writers shared the tales of people that they'd spoken to. And those were amazing, amazing performances, very varied situations. We had one in an, in an ASDA distribution depot. We had one in community centres, in churches, lots of different places, taking our message out to communities. So, our long walks. The first one was from Dover to Crawley. The second one was from Canterbury to Westminster. And next year, we're walking from Runnymede to Westminster, referencing Magna Carta. That's going to be very powerful for us indeed. And former detainees walk with us, so they're made visible in the landscape. And everywhere we go, we spread a language of welcome. The first year, we were a little concerned. We weren't sure what response we would get. The second year, we were a little concerned. The Brexit vote had just happened. We weren't sure if passions would be running high about immigration. But everywhere we went, we were met with welcome. In fact, too much cake, more cake than we could eat. One village, um, someone sent us a, a text the day before and said, I'm not in when you're passing through, but I'm leaving a cake tin by the door of the church. So it almost seemed that people were looking for an opportunity to express the welcome that they feel and to express their generosity. Anyway, that's probably enough to get us started. You haven't come here to really hear me. Um, you've come to hear Dragan and Patience. So um, I'd like to introduce Dragan to you. He's the author of 10 books, fiction, non-fiction, poetry, and contributed to several collections. He's written and directed radio plays, documentaries, hosted over 150 live TV interviews. His oral essay, In My Language I Am Smart, was performed on CBC Radio 1 and published on the CD in 2012. Dragan teaches creative writing at the University of, K of Kent in Canterbury. He's been a great, great friend to Refugee Tales. On our first year, he read his tale and then he came to Crawley for our final event and read it again. He's read for us at the South Bank and um, He's read for us at the launch of Refugee Tales in Shropshire, and he's soon reading for us at the Manchester Literature Festival. So I'm delighted to hand over to Dragan. Thank you for this very kind introduction. Um, and thank you for coming today. Last year, approximately a year and a half ago, actually, uh, I met a man in Birmingham in a space that wasn't quite secret space, but it was well away from something you would find easily. And after carefully tiptoeing around his story and trying to get as much as possible for this story that I will be reading here, carefully tiptoeing around some details because I was asked not to ask about certain things. This person was a victim of torture and when you get such signals as don't ask this or don't go there or don't try to learn about this, it usually means sexual torture was involved. After sitting in that secluded space for about an hour and a half, talking with him, on my way home from Birmingham, I was thinking how that story sounded familiar. And that, I think, is possibly part of the problem that refugees are encountering on their way to their better future, or whatever is waiting in that direction. Um, we need to get deeper into their stories, so they stop being alike to each other. They're all different. None of them is the same. Once we succeed in doing that, we will understand how important this question is because everybody in the world is only one step away from becoming a refugee. We all know that. 
There was something else familiar in his story. And then after three or four days, I remembered that there was a story by Geoffrey Chaucer, and it was titled The Man of Law's Tale. And in The Man of Law, there is a tale about some Syrian people, and this man I interviewed was a Syrian. There is a story about somebody who was thrown onto the open sea and told to learn to sail with no food, no anything. And this was partly the story of this man. And when I realized that at the same time it was inspiring and utterly depressing, inspiring for obvious reasons. As a writer, you're always doing fine if you have Chaucer on your side. Depressing. Six centuries later, we are writing same stories. Six plus centuries later. So I knew that I had to bring in Chaucer into this story. There are two voices when I'm reading parts from Chaucer's tale, I will raise my hand. The rest is contemporary. Please bear with me. The Migrant's Tale. Here beginneth the migrant his tale. In Syria, once upon a time, dwelt a company of rich merchants, trustworthy and true. We are sitting on the second floor of a corner office in Birmingham. This is an area of white shirts and Pink Floyd streets. Metal blinds are all down. I put the chocolate cake I brought for Aziz on the coffee table connecting the three of us and it feels inappropriate. Cream over pain. Our interpreter wears a dark suit and his stern beard makes him look worried. Aziz is dressed in loosely fitting clothes, at least a size bigger. He speaks English, I was told, but feels safer if the interpreter is with us. I would like to start as far as possible from the recent events in his life, so I ask about his childhood in Syria. What were his favorite toys? The interpreter must have used the word game when speaking of toys, and Aziz says, I was a basketball player a team captain. My family was big and important. We were wealthy and never had any problems that I can remember. Oh, sudden bow, you are ever a successor to worldly bliss, sprinkled with bitterness, the end of the joy in the fruit of our labor. Bow waits at the end of our gladness. Hear this counsel for your own safety on happy days do remember the misery that waits behind. He grew up in Dara, in the south of Syria, the city first mentioned in the Egyptian documents some 35 centuries ago. Moses fought his battles here, but that was yesterday. Today, Dara is the place where the Syrian uprising started when 15 school children were arrested for doing graffiti in March 2011. That is an area frequented by despots, droughts, and deities. A hundred kilometers to the north and south lie two capitals, Damascus and Amman. Jerusalem is close. Judaism and Christianity and Islam walk on the same streets, shop in the same souks, fall silent in the afternoon heat, scream at one another when they wake up. Now it happened that these rich merchants decided to visit Rome, whether for business or for pleasure, they would not say. They stayed in that town a certain time, fulfilling their desires. And it so happened that they heard of the excellent renown of the emperor's daughter, Lady Custance. The common report was that she was beautiful without pride, young without folly, humble and courteous the most beautiful woman that ever was or ever will be in this world. With their ships already loaded, 
the merchants declared that they would not return home until they had seen customs for themselves. Once they had seen her, they happily traveled back to Syria. Aziz studied to become a civil engineer. He got married and his wife gave birth to five children. They traveled often. Aziz visited Great Britain four times before the war. He liked it a lot, a land of dignity, wealth, respect, democracy, green. Some of his friends moved to the UK. Now that the civil war in Syria was entering its third year, Aziz was thinking about the island more often. These merchants were much favored by the Sultan of Syria. Whenever they came back from any foreign place, he invited them to be his guests and hungrily questioned them about the news from distant countries and wonders they had heard of or seen. Among other things, the merchants told him about Lady Customs. They spoke of her beauty, of her nobility. They praised her so much in such detail that the Sultan felt a great desire to hold her in his arms. He wanted to love her for as long as he lived. Without customs, he told his council, I am as good as dead. The council spoke at length about magic, about deception, but in the end, they saw the only way to win her was to marry her. And then they understood the difficulties. There was such a difference between the laws of East and West. What need we say? There were treaties and embassies between the two realms. The Pope and the Knights were all in old, and it was agreed that Custance would be accompanied on her journey by bishops, lords, ladies, knights of renown, and other folk. The Christian legation eventually arrived in Syria with a great solemn company. Large was the crowd and rich the assembly of Syrians and Romans when they greeted each other. Then the time arrived for the feast that the Sultaness had organized. Dara is a strategic city crucial for defense of the capital, so the attacks of the Syrian army and the counterattacks of the rebels became a daily occurrence. My whole family was against the regime. Aziz says. His speech becomes broken at times. A short outburst of words in Arabic is followed by a sudden silence. It sounds like automatic weapons in close combat. It sounds like the streets of his hometown today. In Dara, under attack, Everything became difficult, as he says, and makes a very long pause. One of our children fell ill, and we couldn't find medicine in time. We have four children now. He holds his upper arms and rocks back and forth, slow and steady. Waves in the bay. I've seen this same movement, this same posture in other times and other cultures. When the big emotional plates deep below the skin start hitting each other, this wave of pain appears on the surface. The security found out it was me who reported occasionally for foreign media and I was arrested twice. He fires another short burst of memories and falls silent again. Waves. This is the dark zone. I was asked not to ask about his imprisonment. All the guests, Syrian and Christian, were cut or stabbed at the table. All of them cut into pieces, except Lady Customs. The old sultaness, together with her henchmen, did it all. The old crone wanted to rule the country alone. My plan was to reach England, as he says. But every country had closed the door in our face. I found a number and contacted the smuggler. The smuggler asked me to meet him in Skenderie in Egypt. When I arrived, he took me to a flat where there were a number of Syrians already. They were all waiting to leave. He promised us that the journey would start the same day, or the next one, 
it would be, he said, a half an hour trip by a fast boat to a bigger, very nice ship. The journey to Italy should take about four to five days and it would cost 3,700 euros. Customs was dragged to the port, put on a boat without a rudder, told to learn how to sail and set on her way back to Italy. Nothing happened that day or the next one. We remained hidden in that apartment. Suddenly, one night, the smuggler came and said, we are ready to leave. Small vans waited outside to take us to a village on a canal. I don't know where it was, but the water in the canal was in different colors and smelled of chemicals. They told me to lie low and covered me with something. After an hour, they took three of us into a fishing boat that was supposed to take us to a bigger ship. We spent two hours navigating through that canal. It was light enough to see the boat when we arrived to the sea. It was about 25 meters long. The boat was tied to a trawler and we were told this one would tug us to the big ship. There were armed people on the trawler. It was now too late to change my mind. I had no choice but to continue the journey. It was the 19th of May 2013. In auspicious ascent into a bleak house. Unhappy Mars must have fallen out of his place into the darkest house of all. O oh, feeble moon, unhappy your steps. You find yourself where you are not welcomed. Where you were well, from there you are driven away. There was no place to sleep, but at least for the first two days the weather was calm. Suddenly, the skies darkened, the wind howled, the sea turned on us. The rope that tied our boat to the trawler snapped. The captain said we couldn't continue. He said the trawler had mechanical problems and we had to go back to Skanderia. We continued through the strong wind. Our boat was rocking dangerously. The captain promised we would get another boat from Libya. After two days, the wind calmed down a little. The captain informed us there was no boat from Libya, but we were now close to Italy. We didn't know where we were. It was already our sixth day on the sea. I had brought cheese and bread for five days, but managed to stretch it. For days, for years, floated this creature across the eastern Mediterranean and into the Strait of Gibraltar. Such was her fate. Often she expected to die. We entered the Strait of Sicily, close to Malta, and the captain said we went there for fishing. How, if the trawler really had problems? We sensed something bad was going on, as if it was a boat of death. So we demanded to go back to Egypt. We offered to pay him extra just to take us back. One of our party became desperate and threw himself overboard, but they went after him and saved him. At this stage, we all threatened to throw ourselves into the sea. The captain stopped and turned the boat. He said we were going back and in two days we would be there. We were caught in another storm. We were out of food and there was very little water. They gave us stale bread to eat, the one that they use as bait for fishing. It was very hard. We had to soak it in water to soften it. Then we saw the smuggler approaching on a new fishing boat, towing another boat behind. There were other passengers in it, many of them. We were told this new trawler would take us to Italy. Place her in the same ship in which she arrived here. Then push the ship out to sea. And forbid her ever to return. Oh, customs. Well may your spirit tremble. Well may your dreams be sorrowful. We were ordered into the new boat. 44 of us, men, women and children. The new boat was smaller than the old boat. It didn't bode well. 
There was smoke coming from the engine room, very dangerous. Behind us was the boat full of young Egyptians, we discovered, all under 18. Suddenly they moved all the Egyptians from the second boat to our boat, 75 of them plus 44 of us. There was no place to move. The vessel was now too heavy, so the water came to the gunnels and started overflowing. Our original trawler turned and went back. The boat continued, but it was now very slow. Even though we had been told we were four hours away from Italy, they told us now there was at least 17 hours. The Egyptians told us about the plan. Under the Italian laws, anyone under the age of 18 could walk free, no detention at all. So they had informed the Italian army to come and capture them. The Italians, they said, knew about our coming. They would wait for us. The night fell. We stood in the boat. There was no place to sit or lie down. Then it dawned, and we couldn't see any other ship. We stood under the sun. There was no food. Another night, we stood in the boat. The water was overflowing. Since she was not slain at the feast, who kept her from drowning in the sea? Who saved Jonah in the belly of the whale when he was spat out at Nineveh? It was a great miracle to feed the crowd of 5,000 only with five loaves and two fishes. Who saved her from drowning in the sea? Three ships of the Italian Coast Guard arrived in the morning. But they didn't do anything. Just surrounded our boat and stood like that, taking photos. I spoke to an Italian captain. I said, help us. The water is coming in. We are sinking. He said, tell us first the name of the smuggler. We said, help us. We are hungry. We don't have food or water. He said, give us the name. We refused to say the name. He said, there no food or water. I then gave them the names of three people I knew from Dara, none of whom was the smuggler. They took us in. It was the 4th of June. My journey had taken 16 days. So she floated ahead into our own ocean and our own fierce northern seas. A victorious senator sailing home to Rome came upon the ship in which Custance was abandoned. Nothing he knew of who she was or why in such state. She would not talk of her rank, ready to die but not reveal anything. They took us to the detention center on Lampedusa. They lined us to a narrow corridor and in, their, in a narrow corridor and told us they needed to get our fingerprints. The Egyptians knew the system. They gave their fingerprints right away and were let go. We Syrians asked, why do you need our fingerprints? They said to check that we were not terrorists. But we had our ID cards, our passports, so we refused. For 10 days we had no food, we were hungry, but we were told we wouldn't be given any food until we gave our fingerprints. We didn't want to do it because we all had our families back home. And the Italians would reveal that we were gone when checking with the Syrian security. In her language, Custans asked for mercy to be released from the misery of such life. When he saw that there was nothing to find on the vessel, he brought the sad woman onto dry land. She kneeled down and thanked God for all the mercy. But who she was, she would not tell anyone. Nothing good or bad would make her speak. The Italians took the women and children away and left us Syrian men in the corridor. Then came a police commander whose face I will never forget. He ordered his men to beat us and they took our fingerprints by force. And then they gave us food and water. 
A woman from the UN Refugee Agency arrived. We told her about the beating and she didn't believe us. After she checked with the Italian policemen and they confirmed our story, she came back and said, it seemed that this really happened, in which case you can go to court and state your case. But I, didn't, I don't think you, were, you would achieve anything. Better apply for asylum. Then she told us that for asylum they needed to take the fingerprints again. It was a separate process. We refused. They told us that in that case we had to go back to Syria. Some of my friends then agreed, gave their fingerprints and continued. Some to Sweden, some to Germany, some to the UK. But I have a family. I went back to Syria. I told them. They beat us in Syria. They beat us in Italy. What's the difference? King Allah went to visit the home of the senator and see the woman for himself. The senator greeted the king with great honors and then sent after customs. When Allah saw his wife, he greeted her gently and began to weep so much it was hard to watch. He knew it was her. Customs herself for sorrow stood dumb as a tree. Her heart was shut. She swooned, then stood up, then swooned again. They wept together, lamented the past. Long was the sobbing and the bitter pain before their hearts could open again. My family thought I was dead. It was the 19th of June when my mobile started working again. I was in Turkey. I called home and was told that my wife was arrested. She was accused of helping the insurgents. She's a nurse. Of course it wasn't true. One of my brothers was also in jail. I entered Syria clandestinely. After some time, they released my wife from prison. My brother was still in custody, and my other brother was with the insurgents. Who could describe the joy and sorrow that now, that now filled the hearts of Custance, Allah, and the Emperor? I shall make an end of this tale. The day is fading fast. I could not stay in Syria. I went to another smuggler. He charged me 4,500 euros to take me back by truck from Turkey to England. It was six of us, hidden behind some large boxes. Every night we would come out for some fresh air and to stretch out. Some of the passengers went to other, to other countries. I don't know where. In the end, I remained alone in a truck and exited only after we were deep in the UK, in Nottingham. I was very ill by then. My kidney stones started hurting badly. When I arrived, I called my friend who lives here to come pick me up. In his apartment, I recovered a few days, then I applied for asylum. I was put in a detention center. I was very ill and kept asking every single day to be released. It took them 100 days to let me go, in spite of the support of several organizations. And so, in virtue and in charity, they all lived. They were never parted except by death itself. And farewell now, my tale has come to an end. Aziz's story hasn't come to an end. His family is in the Ra, and his wife is losing patience. He is now afraid that she would take their children and embark on one of the death boats. Our talk is over. Aziz stands up to take the glass of water from the other table, and only now I realize that his clothes are the right size, but that he shrinks when he sits down as if expecting a blow. Thank you, Dragan. And now Patience. Patience, like Barbie, has performed her poetry all over the world. 
She's celebrated for her monologues, giving voice to those who might otherwise be unheard. So you can tell why we approached her very early on in the process to write for us. She's published four collections of poetry. She's lectured in several UK universities. She was made Canterbury Laureate, and her fourth collection of poetry was Telling Tales, a Canterbury Tales for the 21st century. You can see even more why we approached her early on in the process. It was shortlisted for the Ted Hughes Award for New Work in Poetry in 2014 and the 2015 Wales Book of the Year. She read for us in Crawley at the end of the first walk. She read for us at the ICA at the end of the second walk. She's read for us at the preview of the book at the Hay Festival. And she's been a great friend to Refugee Tales. Please welcome Patience. Thank you, Small Wonder Festival, for inviting me. The Refugee's Tale is primarily based in Sudan, and the speaker of the tale is a middle-aged woman, and I've called her Farida, but Farida is not her real name. But when I met Farida, she was accompanied by a lawyer who told me that I wasn't allowed to use her real name and I had to change some of the details of her story. However, I've tried as much as possible to use her idioms and her story, the pattern of her story. So what you're going to get now is a kind of, I would call a, a collaboration um, between me and Farida. The Refugee's Tale. Maybe the real story begins here, in this office, before you press record, and we look in the mirror of each other's eyes. We're first time meeting. Maybe you say the word refugee in your head when you call me for reader. Refugee, what is that burn mark on your hand? You already have a story of the torture I suffered in my war-torn homeland. But these marks are from cooking bread for my family. This is the first time I'm cooking in my life. I never even made a cup of tea back home. I make a very good falafel. You must try. Are you recording? Food of the homestead. Christians, Muslims, we bake the same flatbread. Christians and Muslims break the same bread before the change. Though my parents are Egyptian, I am born in Sudan. Sudan is in my blood. Though I am always a Christian, even for 10 years I love Muslims more than Christians. My Muslim neighbours care for my parents when we jet set to Paris or Rome. I love Muslims as I love the new birth, love my country. We cops, always first class. We had good English, all of us working in the banks. Cleaner to driver, everyone is close to Farida. No door that is not wide open, thanks to God. Since I leave university, mid-year, and that day, I start my career. The day I started my banking career, my parents complained, but they couldn't control me. Back then was good atmosphere. I am making good money. My husband is running his business in patents. We build a large family house. We have six children and some flats in Egypt for the pensions of our parents. Always we are donating to the poor of the brethren. Then government changes. Doors begin to close. At work, what took two hours now takes two weeks and Christians are flocking overnight to the US. Then, the rumour of a banking leak. Watching the planes flying over my head, I refuse to leave my country, my homestead. I refused. I love my country. 
my homestead, my mother, my father, my husband's father and mother, the motherland. I would rather be buried dead than leave. I was the last one to leave. My brother-in-law, he's unwell. He needed support to heal his divided mind. We nurture him like a plant and polish each leaf, each flower, to help seal him together. Like the two faiths that can't be divided by politicians completely corrupted, splitting the country like an open wound. They insert a lie and this Christian's abducted. I refused to cover my head, but my heart was divided by language, river, boundary, country, the day I retreated my status to refugee. Why should I be treated as stranger, as refugee in the country I was born, barricaded in my bank, while demonstrators outside shout blasphemy, hundreds, thousands fed on propaganda poison. We're told, remain calm, stay here, you have food. But my phone buzzed like a dying insect, my husband, my children, my parents pleading with God. I remembered the side door, the back exit where the generator hummed in the dark. And I find myself descending the iron stairs, the noise of the crowd out front like a bull shark. And somehow my legs find the car, my hands on the gears, and my friend is closing the door, imagining the crowbar fist of the crowd pounding on my car. The fist-headed crowd are pounding on my car. My car is not moving. Each fist has a face that looks like my own. How can we be at war when the Nile flows through our twin faiths? If my car is my coffin, their fists are the clods of earth, the rich yellow soil of my country. I start the engine, praying, dear God, let it let it not stall. But the car is the black and the steel of a bulletproof jacket. Today, it will save my life. With my hands on the steering wheel and my life in the hand of God, it begins to move and the waving fists part like the Dead Sea. I still think it's miracle I find myself free. It's miracle I'm still having job but my mind is not free. Each day government is ringing for bank information that I am not having. They don't believe me. More doors are closed in my face with no explanation. Maybe somewhere there's a typed memo. On a blank piece of paper, someone has printed my name. Someone is watching my house. How, I don't know. Anger is a gloved hand and a flickering flame. That night, the family is sleeping on the second floor, except my oldest son and daughter coming back from Coptic Club. They open the side door and all they are smelling is smoke. Someone broke into our life, their hand through our window bars that night to smother the moon and stars. The night, smoke choked the moon and the stars. I tried to call the fire. I tried to call them hundreds of times. If it wasn't for our neighbours hearing us shouting, my neighbours came and there was water. I shouted like crazy, please, please help us at this address. And nobody came, like they arranged it maybe the fire brigade not to come, and we all perish. My husband insisted to break the room and go inside, and the flames, I was so worried about him, but my neighbours, all my family, survived. We prayed there together, Christian and Muslim. In the heat of the fire, we knelt on the earth and wept. I thought I forget, but their love... I'll never forget. 
I thought I'd forget in this life, but I never forget the three hours it took for the fire engine to arrive felt like three days. There is no regret. We were lucky to be alive. But how can you sleep then, knowing the country you love wants you to die? How can you close your eyes shut when they've been pitted like an olive? I'm praying to God every night, but then after that, they started with my husband. He was away with his business abroad. They arrested him at customs, coming back to our country, his papers ignored. He sensed something bad would, had a premonition. The day they imprisoned my husband, he had not eaten. They put my husband in prison. He is not eating the right foods. They knew he was diabetic, but they're starving him of insulin. Wouldn't let me give him his medicine. I was frantic. I didn't know where he was based. Didn't know what they can do to him to get me. And finally I decided there was no way. I could not resist. That's when I decided to leave my beloved country. They said, you should be grateful we left you in peace. This is a Muslim country, but we let you pray in your churches cooperate for your husband's release. I know nothing of that bank information to this day. Always I'm wearing my cross and refuse to sweat in the heavy blackened steel of a bulletproof jacket. The heavy blackened steel of a bulletproof jacket is the depression I wear on the worst days when freedom here weighs heavier than the death threat back home and my family fall on their knees but back home I refused. Why should Farida wear widow's black when there is still hope for my husband? To bend the bars on his prison windows, always there's light on the horizon. I knew a Muslim official, a friend of my husband. Farida, trust me, I have a plan. So I'm buying us tickets to London, even then thinking we can come back when things calm down. The day of his release, I'm barely breathing. Meeting him at the airport, the sky is bleeding. When I met him at the airport, he was bleeding. His chest was full of blood and he had ulcerative colitis. He is needing urgent medical, very sick. He bled onto the flight and is sleeping very peaceful, and the whole of my family is here and safe. As soon as we land, we take him to hospital, and they save his life. An international visa is an open door, but the next day we go to Croydon to claim asylum, and though the lady is very kind, it pains me more than everything to cut myself from my home, my country, with each section of my claim, my story, depressed photo in a frame. The story depends where you put the frame. With my oldest son, my oldest daughter, each in a separate room, but exactly the same questions, each the author of a story that will match, they will match, to see if the grief fits together, the jigsaw of what it is to love your country and be forced to leave your whole life behind in broken images. For me, it was lucky. Maybe God knows how much I suffered. Maybe it was easy to check my job, my contacts. Maybe the fictions in the newspapers were detained by the facts. Now, I'm underclass, my head covered with shame. How am I begging when I can't remember my name? How can I begin to remember my name when I can't leave the house? When the ache of leaving my mother, she died. The blame is too much. My whole body drowned with grieving in this room with the ribbed roof where I sit with my sins heavy as Jonah. This silent attic where memories play back like the cries of muezzins mixed with the cries from the priest when she first fell sick. 
but good people come, who open me to feel again for others, and as I translate the words of a refugee life to a form, I begin to heal. Their voice is my own voice, striking a chord. May our truth conquer fear. Maybe the real story begins here. Maybe the real story begins here. When Christians and Muslims broke the same flatbread. The day I started my banking career and refused to leave my country, my homestead. Maybe the day I retreated my status to refugee. Or the fist-headed crowd pounding on my car and the miracle when I find myself free. The night the smoke choked the moon and the stars. I thought I forget, but some things you never forget. The day they imprisoned my husband, he is not eating. The heavy blackened steel of my bulletproof jacket when I met him at the airport, broken, bleeding. The story ends where you put the frame. But however it begins, remember my name. challenge was or, or how different it was working not just for your imaginations with them too but working with real real people's stories mm -hmm. like patience I renamed uh, the man in this story and gave him uh, the name Aziz which I can reveal now is um, the translation of my name into Arabic um, these encounters change you. It's pretty much impossible to meet somebody like this and to hear a story like this and then go home and watch Strictly Come Dancing or something. Um, you, you, you enter that world and um, I was only hoping when writing this story that that was the biggest challenge to uh, that drama that was given to me to put it properly on paper so don't uh, I, I didn't want to to make it any more dramatic than it was or any less I just uh, my biggest fear was to not strike the right note because when when I was there in that room with him and the translator and Inter interpreter, and when he was telling, giving me his story, which I think is one of the most generous gifts that anyone can do, for someone to give you their life story, it's um, uh, amazingly um, beautiful. It's, uh, it's there is something very ancient in that, like like giving the newcomers bread and salt, welcoming them with bread and salt, and. Here, from the other side, a, a, a newcomer is giving you his story. And if you actually remember some a brilliant books from the history of literature, and, and uh, from Marco Polo uh, onwards, a traveler is supposed to give their story to those who have not traveled. And one must respect that. And that was the biggest challenge, to, to take the story and make a good home on paper for it. I think, I mean, Dragon said it so beautifully, I, I would just add that for me it was very much about voice and about really honouring that voice that we don't hear in the media. So I listened over and over to the interview and I, I suddenly, there were certain phrases I picked out. And I wanted to work with the way that as, when someone's telling their life story, inevitably there is repetition, they go back to certain things and I started to see these repetitions which kind of fed the form of the piece. Mm. I was a little bit nervous about making it into a very formal poem. You, I ended up using the corona form, some of you might be familiar with. 
hearing those repetitions, but I, I also wanted to, I suppose, create something, kind of capture the music of her idiom. And what was wonderful when I actually read the poem for the very first time, she was there in the audience and she came up to me at the end and just said, this is me. And that's all I needed to know, again, that I'd you know, struck the, the right note with the story. So I think we've got time for maybe a couple of questions from the audience. Um. Well, there's going to be another, another walk next year from the 30th of June to the 5th of July with another set of writers reading another set of tales. Um, go to our website refugeetales.org gives you ideas of things that you can do if you're concerned about indefinite detention, if you feel transformed by these stories to want to take action um, that's the place to go to, to to get information about the next step. We're appearing at quite a few festivals um, so those are also on the website if you want to, to follow our future progress. And if I may add just shortly what Anna will not tell you, but I can as an outsider. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, once you start helping refugee tales, uh, you are in a brilliant company. Uh, some amazing people are um, uh, part of this project and, and working on the project. And we are getting it from uh, all sides. And, and so I would really encourage you to, to become part of it. The way it relates is simply to, to humanise the figures, as I said before, and to make people aware that once people arrive in this country, they haven't arrived in the promised land, and the process of seeking sanctuary <coughs> causes untold suffering. And sometimes the stories of people coming across Europe, they're very dramatic, they're very... Um, important on camera but stories of people being locked away in indefinite detention in the UK are less visible so it's just to raise awareness of that. One more question maybe? <laughs> 